Hello everyone. Today we are going to study a very important topic, antiplatelet, anticoagulant in fibrinolytic drugs. Uh, I have divided uh, this chapter into uh, three lectures. First, in the, this lecture we will be discussing about the antiplatelet drugs. Uh, before going into the drugs and the pharmacology section, uh, first of all we should discuss about the difference between arterial and venous thrombosis. The basic difference between arterial and venous thrombosis is arterial thrombus is platelet rich. This is platelet rich. That's why it is white in color. On the other hand, venous thrombus, these are rich in fibrin, red blood cells, and red blood cells. Definitely, arterial thrombus also has fibrin, but in lesser amount. Similarly, venous thrombus also has platelet, but in lesser amounts. Okay. And venous thrombosis, because of the RBCs, it is red in color. So, arterial thrombus are described as white in nature and venous thrombus as red in nature. Because arterial thrombus is platelet rich and venous thrombus is fibrin and red blood cell rich. Now, this arterial thrombus, uh, because it is platelet rich, in case of arterial thrombosis, we prefer giving antiplatelet drugs. We prefer giving antiplatelet drugs rather than anticoagulation. Okay. So, antiplatelet drugs are preferred in cases of arterial thrombosis, like in cases of MI, like in cases of stroke, cerebral vascular accidents. But in cases of venous thrombosis, we prefer giving anticoagulants, anticoagulants like uh, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Here, antiplatelet drugs does not have much role. Okay, so this is the basic stuff. Now we will see uh, what are the antithrombotic agents. Antithrombotic agents are antiplatelet drugs, anticoagulants and fibrinolytic agents. So we will start with the antiplatelet drugs. Again before going into the drugs, uh, what is the role of platelet and coagulation system in thrombogenesis? So whenever there is vascular injury, so thrombus formation happens whenever there is a vascular injury. Whenever there is vascular injury, there will be exposure of soft endothelial collagen. There is, there is exposure of Subendothelial collagen. Now, this subendothelial collagen will bind to this von Willebrand factor. They will bind to von Willebrand factor. And this von Willebrand factor will bring platelet and make a connection between the subendothelial collagen and platelet. This is the collagen and this is the platelet. And this von Willebrand factor, factor will make a connection between these two. Now, in the collagen, the receptors are alpha 2, beta 1 and GP V1. GP V1. In platelet, the receptors are GP1 B alpha and GP2 B PA. Okay. Among this, in case of collagen, the alpha 2, beta 1, alpha 2, uh, beta 1 and in case of platelet, the GP1, B alpha, these two are very important and they help in binding to the collagen, subendothelial collagen with the help of von Willebrand factor. Okay. Now, once this platelet is bound to the collagen, once this platelet is bound to the collagen, now there will be recruitment of more and more platelet here and there will be activation of these platelets these platelets will be will get activated now once these platelets are activated they will release adp thromboxin a2 adp is already prepared and stored stored inside the granules and thromboxin a2 is uh, immediately synthesized and released into the circulation okay now again this ADP and thrombosin A2 will, will augment this process of more and more platelet aggregation and activation, more and more platelet recruitment and activation. Okay. Now, once you underst understand this, you should also know 
why in normal circumstances how the uh, platelet aggregation or activation is prevented under normal circumstances so if there is no vascular injury under normal circumstances under normal circumstances the platelet is rendered inactive okay so platelet is rendered inactive how it is kept inactive it is kept inactive by the nitric oxide and pgi2 that is prostacyclin nitric oxide and prostacyclin these two are released from uh, from the endothelium from the endothelium so if the endothelium is normal there is no injury they will produce nitric oxide and prostacyclin which will keep the platelet in the inactive state and also this endothelium will have endothelium will also possess cd39 they also have this cd39 which has function of adph adph so this will destroy this will destroy the adp release by the platelet so that it will it can it cannot cause more activation or aggregation of the platelets okay so this adp and thromboxin a2 they help in aggregation okay so, so this is the platelet but on the other hand you can see once there is vascular injury there is also tissue factor exposure once there is tissue factor exposure there is activation of coagulation through factor 7a the initial factor that is activated is factor 7a once it is exposed to tissue factor now once factor 7 is activated there is further activation of the coagulation pathway and ultimately there will be thrombin generation and fibrin formation once thrombin is generated it will convert to it will convert fibrinogen to fibrin now this fibrin and platelet they will make the platelet fibrin thrombus platelet fibrin thrombus okay so this is the basic mechanism more uh, details about the platelet and the uh, coagulation pathway we will be studying in the hematology section so this is how platelet fibrin thrombus is formed i have already told in case of arterial thrombus platelet is more and in case of venous thrombus fibrin is more along with trapping of rbcs okay along with trapping of rbcs so this is arterial thrombus and this is venous thrombus but i have also told you that arterial thrombus will also have some amount of fibrin and venous thrombus will also have some amount of platelet now what are the antiplatelet drugs what are the groups of anti platelet drugs that we are going to study now the first one is aspirin that is cox inhibitor as you can see here cox 1 cox 1 is needed for production of thromboxin a2 so aspirin which is uh, inhibiting the cox 1 that is the, that is our first antiplatelet drug okay that is our first antiplatelet drug the second one is uh, drugs that inhibit drugs that inhibit adp drugs that inhibit adp we have already read about the function of this adp and the thromboxin a2 so the second group is drugs that inhibit adp that includes clopidogrel rasogrel ticagrel and cancrel there was one more drug in this group that is ticlopidin ticlopidin now this is not used because of thrombocytopenia in your thrombocytopenia that it can produce it is not used now that's why it is not given in this table then the third group is third group is third group is inhibitor of gp2b3a now this gp2b3a is required for platelet aggregation i will tell you platelet aggregation which is stimulated by adp and thromboxin a2 you need gp2b3a if it to be 3a i have also mentioned here that this also plays a role in platelet addition but it has a much bigger role in platelet aggregation so gp to be 3a inhibitors are are our third group of antiplatelet drugs remember this gp to be 3a activation and formation of platelet aggregation is the last step in the process of platelet activation or platelet uh, this uh, platelet plug formation so that's why the drugs that inhibit this gp2b3 these are the strongest antiplatelet agents so these are the 
strongest antifractal elements. Now the fourth one is fourth group is uh, thrombin receptor antagonist. Okay, thrombin receptor antagonist that is known as vorapaxel. That is known as vorapaxel. The receptor is PAR and vorapaxel is PAR antagonist. Okay, so these are the four groups of antiplatelet drugs. We will read them one by one. First, we will start with aspirin. What is the mechanism of action of aspirin? So, aspirin causes irreversible acetylation, irreversible acetylation of COX enzyme, predominantly COX1 enzyme. It can also cause inhibition. It can also cause inhibition of inhibition of COX. Two, inhibition of COX-2. However, you need very high dose of the drug, around more than equal to 1 gram per day of drug is needed to inhibit COX-2. The drug that, uh, the, the dose that is used for antiplatelet action of aspirin is very low. It is around 75 to, it is around 75 to 325 milligram per day. In many of the cases when we use uh, dual antiplatelet or triple antiplatelet agent, the uh, dose of aspirin is kept less than 100 mg per day. So at this dose, it cannot inhibit COX-2, cannot inhibit COX-2. So it causes inhibition of COX-1 leading to decreased production of thromboxin A2, decreased production of thromboxin A2. One important point you have to remember here, that COX-1 also helps in production of PGI to prostacycline from endothelium and I have told in the beginning that prostacycline helps in preventing the platelet activation. Now if aspirin is prevent, uh, also inhibiting prostacycline formation then how it is acting as an antiplatelet agent. Now you have to remember that the thromboxin A2 production is decreased. Usually thromboxin A2 is produced in the platelet. And prostacycline is produced in the endothelium. The endothelium is a nucleated structure. It is a nucleated structure. So even if aspirin, aspirin blocks COX, COX1 enzyme, this endothelium can reproduce the prostacycline, can reproduce the prostacyclines. But platelets, once it is blocked, once it is irreversibly blocked, because it doesn't have nucleus, it cannot produce more and more thromboxin A2. Okay, so that's why aspirin. Uh, the predominant action of aspirin is to uh, cause inhibition of or uh, decrease the production of thromboxin A2. That's how it causes, uh, that's how it shows is antiplatelet activity. Indications are multifold. Uh, we'll be studying in the cardiovascular system uh, we use in uh, myocardial infarction, both STEMI or non ST elevated acute uh, coronary syndromes in cases of, uh, in case of CNS, we use in uh, CVA. Apart from that, aspirin has many other roles uh, in as anti-inflammatory agent. As anti-inflammatory agents also it has role, but as antiplatelet we mainly use for myocardial infarction and stroke. Okay, ischemic stroke. Ischemic stroke. Side effects, the most common side effects are GI related. GI related. This include dyspepsia. Dyspepsia and GI bleed. Okay. And the uh, risk of bleed. Risk of bleed is around 1 to 3 percent. 1 to 3 percent per year. If aspirin is used alone, the risk of bleed is 1 to 3 percent per year. Apart from that, they can also have allergic manifestations, especially patients who are atopic. Okay, especially patients who are atopic having orticaria or bronchial asthma, they can produce allergic reaction to aspirin causing severe bronchospasm. Apart from that, it can also cause liver, hepatic and renal dysfunction, hepatic and renal dysfunction. Now the last thing is what is aspirin resistance? Aspirin resistance is actually 
we can describe as two types one is clinical another one is biochemical clinical and another one is biochemical clinical aspirin resistance is if the patient is already on aspirin and still develops a atherosclerotic or thrombotic episode arterial ischemic episode that is known as clinical resistance but for us biochemical resistance is much more important uh, this is defined as failure failure of the drug to produce failure of the drug to produce inhibitory effect on cells of platelet function for example thromboxin a2 synthesis or arachidonic acid induced platelet aggregation so this you can see in the labs you can do this test and we can see whether aspirin is functioning or not okay that's all about the aspirin now we'll come to the next group of drugs these are atp receptor antagonists atp receptor antagonists now this atp receptor antagonists are divided into two groups one is irreversible groups another one is the reversible group Uh, and we have also studied that aspirin is also irreversible inhibitor now what is the significance of irreversible inhibitors irreversible inhibitors means once the platelet is uh, inhibited uh, uh, the effect will stay till new platelet are formed so all of you must be knowing the lifetime of platelets are around 5 to 7 days it is around 5 to 7 days so once these drugs are used and after using these drugs once you have stopped these drugs the effect will stay for 5 to 7 more days so you cannot do any uh, kind of surgery during those 5 to 7 days because there is a high risk of bleeding because new platelets have not formed so that's why if you want to do surgery in these patients who are on irreversible antiplatelet agents you have to stop the drug and wait for at least 5 to 7 days now coming to this atp receptor antagonists irreversible atp receptor antagonists these are thiopyridines and this includes the drugs name as clopidogrel and rasugrel clopidogrel and rasugrel i already told you that one more drug was included in this group that is ciclopidine which is not used now because of severe thrombocytopenia associated with this drug mechanism of action is written here that is adp receptor antagonist and the receptor is p2 y12 receptor But remember, these two drugs, they are pro drugs. They are pro drugs, and they need activation. They need activation by CYP two C nineteen enzyme. They need activation by CYP two C nineteen enzyme to become the active drug. To become the active drug. indications again similar they are used as dual antiplatelet agents along with aspirin along with aspirin and post pci post pci they are used at least for 4 weeks in cases of bare metal stents and at least for 1 year in cases of drug eluting stents this completing with combination so if we are using aspirin plus clopidogrel clopidogrel plus aspirin the risk of bleed is around 2% per year 2% per year only aspirin i told it is around 1 to 3% per year and along with clopidogrel it is around 2% per year this is marginally increased from the aspirin alone dose the prasugrel how it is different from uh, clopidogrel now this pra prasugrel is more potent it is more potent and if it is more potent definitely it can cause more bleeding more bleeding especially intracranial bleed intracranial bleeds that's why it is avoided that's why it is avoided 
in any patients, any patient more than 75 years of age, and any patient with history of cerebrovascular accident. So avoid in this group. Also, it is used with caution. It is used with caution in patients who are less than 60 kg and who have renal function, uh, renal failure. The dosing uh, for clopidogrel, for clopidogrel it is 300 to 600 loading dose followed by 75 mg OD. For rasugrel it is 60 mg loading followed by 10 mg per day maintenance dose. Side effects are bleeding of course. But apart from that, they can also produce neutropenia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and TTP. That is thrombotic, thromboangiopathic purpura. Okay. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Coming to the resistance, resistance of these thionopyridines is based on the CYP 2C19 polymorphism. CYP 2C19 polymorphism. So, if some patients have reduced activity of this CYP 2C19, they will have less, uh, 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 they will uh, they, they, they will not be able to activate these prodrugs. So, they will have reduced activity of this thionopyridines leading to resistance of these drugs. But this resistance, this CYP 2C19 polymorphism is not, it actually affects the uh, pharmacokinetics of clopidogrel, but it is not that effective against prasugrel. So, prasugrel is a better drug in patients with this polymorphism because this polymorphism will not affect uh, the activation of prasugrel that much as compared to the clopidogrel. And one more point you have to remember, some PPIs can also inhibit this CYP2C19. But however, the common PPI that we use, pantoprazole, it has very less effect on this. It has very less effect on this. So, pantoprazole can be used if you want to use PPI along with these drugs. Pantoprazole can be used. Now, coming to the reversible ADP receptor antagonist. Now, reversible ADP receptor antagonist there are two examples. One is Ticagrelor, another one is Cangrelor. Remember this, Cangrelor is IV drug. Okay, Ticagrelor is oral, but Cangrelor is IV. So this is the only parenteral ADP receptor antagonist. Okay, mechanism of action, uh, action is same. They, they also inhibit this P2Y12 receptor, ADP receptor. And you have to remember that they do not need, they do not need activation. They do not need activation. That means they, these are not prodrugs. They do not need activation. So that's why they will produce predictable response. They produce predictable response. Dosing for ticagrelor is 180 mg loading dose followed by 90 mg. Twice daily. Side effect of ticagrelor. Side effect of ticagrelor. You have to remember. It is again. It is again from uh, uh, bleeding. It is again bleeding. But along along with that, there is one more side effect that you have to remember. For ticagrelor is dyspnea. Now this is a very important side effect because mechanism for this is unknown. Mechanism of this is unknown. So, dyspnea can happen in patients taking ticagrelor. However, this is self limiting. Okay, this is self limiting. Now, there is an uh, antidote for ticagrelor. Antidote for ticagrelor.
that is under development antidote for ticagrelor that is under development that is known as pentrixen so this drug this drug is antidote for ticagrelor that is under development now coming to cancrelor 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 is used iv it is used iv this also doesn't need activation this also doesn't need activation but remember cancrelor it is used as peri procedural agent peri procedural agent it's around the time of pci if you are not using if you have not used other adp receptor antagonist this can be used as iv infusion so the, the dosage includes 30 microgram per kg start followed by 4 microgram per kg per minute for around 2 hour infusion 2 hour or uh, 2 hour duration or the duration of the procedure or the duration of the procedure which over is longer which over is longer so 30 microgram per kg start followed by 4 hour or 4 microgram per kg per minute for around 2 hour duration or the duration of the procedure which over is longer we have to use cancrelor infusion now how to uh, transit it now transition to oral drugs transition to oral drugs now if you are using ticagrelor if you are using ticagrelor this can be given the loading dose can be given during the infusion during the infusion but if you are if you are planning to use clopidogrel or prasugrel the loading dose should be given after infusion after infusion okay so after giving cancrelor during the procedure if you are planning to and you are planning to uh, start oral therapy and if you are planning to give ticagrelor you can give the loading dose during the infusion and after that you can give the maintenance dose once the infusion is over but in case of clopidogrel and prasugrel you have to give uh, the loading dose only after the infusion one more point i want to tell the the bleeding that is happening during ticagrelor use here platelet infusion platelet transfusion is not useful platelet transfusion is not at all useful i'll just check the name of this drug i am not uh, very sure whether the name is correct or not i'll just check it so the name is intra sima sorry for the confusion so it is not bentrixen it is bentra sima okay this is the correct answer now coming to the uh, next uh, adp receptor antagonist uh, now this dipyridamol sorry this is not adp receptor antagonist but this is also anti platelet agent but this is not very useful this is not very useful that's why in the initial image where i have shown all the groups of uh, antiplatelet agent this dipyridamol is not mentioned there it is not very useful clinically now not very useful clinically now but some points you have to remember because it is mentioned in the harrison now what is the mechanism of action but before that what is agrinox agrinox is a combination of aspirin this combination of aspirin plus dipyridamol dipyridamol mechanism action it is written here there are two mechanisms one is it inhibits the phosphodiesterase inhibits the phosphodiesterase other mechanism is inhibit adenosine uptake adenosine uptake now by inhibiting phosphodiesterase 
it is preventing the uh, catabolism of cyclic AMP and by inhibiting uptake of adenosine it is also decreasing the formation of cyclic AMP so formation of sorry it, it is causing in, uh, increase in formation of cyclic AMP now this adenosine actually through A2 receptor this receptor is actually GI means GPCR G protein coupled receptor inhibitory type okay so this GI receptor so if adenosine binds to this receptor it will cause it will cause decrease in cyclic AMP decrease in cy cyclic AMP by inhibiting the adenylate cyclase enzyme so if this adenosine is not there there is increase in cyclic AMP formation and also by inhibiting phosphodiesterase it is preventing the metabolism of cyclic AMP so the net effect is increase in cyclic AMP once the cyclic AMP is increased uh, in intracellularly it will cause uh, it will cause reduction of calcium, decrease calcium and that will lead to uh, decrease activation and aggregation of the platelet. Decrease activation and aggregation of the platelet. That is how it shows the anti-platelet effect. However, it has vasodilatory property. Vasodilatory property. That is why it is shows Robin Port phenomenon. Robin Port phenomenon cases of coronary artery disease cases, cases of coronary artery disease so that's why it is not at all useful for coronary artery disease because it has vasodilatory property it has vasodilatory property showing robin hood phenomenon what is robin hood phenomenon i'll be discussing uh, later in detail if you don't if you don't know what is robin hood phenomenon anyway for the time being you remember because of the vasodilatory property it cannot be used in, in patients with coronary artery disease. And also because of the vasodilatory properties, it can cause hypotension. Hypotension, flushing, and headache. Indication, if you want to use dipyridomone, though it is not very used uh, clinically, it can still be, uh, if, you, if you really want to use it, you can use in patients with stroke along with aspirin, TVA along with aspirin in patients less than 75 years of age. Okay. So, what is important here is the mechanism. Now coming to the next group of drugs that these are GP2B3A antagonists. GP2B3A antagonists. Mechanical action is I have already told they inhibit the GP2B3A and I have told you GP2B3A is very important for aggregation of the platelets and remember GP2B3A this is the most abundant most abundant receptor on platelet most abundant receptor on platelet this helps in aggregation and also there is a minor role in adhesion along with the von Willebrand factor. Okay, these drugs are three in number Apsiximab, Liptipivatide, and Tyropivan. You have to remember this table. This table uh, clearly uh, uh, tells us about the uh, different properties of these three drugs. Now, Apsiximab is actually a FAB fragment. This is a FAB fragment of humanized humanized mouse monoclonal antibody, humanized mouse monoclonal antibody. Peptipivatide is cyclical AGD containing heptapeptide. Tyrofibin is non peptide, non peptide uh, RGD mimetic. KGD and RGDs, uh, these are nothing but the uh, peptide groups. These are peptide groups, details are not required. Just remember, KGD containing heptapeptide is heptifibatide, and RGD mimetic is tyrofibin, which is a non peptide. Regarding the specificity for this GP2B3A, Apsiximab is not specific, 
but ft pivotide and tyrofiban they are specific for gp2b3a plasma half life is very short Plasma half life is short for abscissimal in minutes. That's why given as infusion, almost all of them are given as infusion. Peptipivatide has longer half life, around 2.5 hours. Tyrofibon also has a longer half life that is around 2 hours. But platelet bound half life of abscissimal is much more. This is much more. That is in days, and it can be found on the surface of the platelet up to two weeks. So platelet bound half life of abscissimal is much more, but plasma half life is less. Okay, but in for active fibrotide and tyrofibrin it is less. That is in seconds. In seconds. Renal clearance it is not there for abscissimal, but renal clearance is there for active fibrotide and tyrofibrin. So active fibrotide and tyrofibrin they are specific for GP2B3 here. They have longer T half. They have reduced platelet bound TF and they are cleared through kidney. These are the points you have to remember. Okay. Why it is important? Because if the patient has renal dysfunction, it is better to avoid epipivotide and tyrofibrin and it is better to use abscissimal. Indication again, these are used very procedurally. Very procedure, procedural. Of course, the procedure is PC, percutaneous coronary. Intervention. The dosing, I'll be just telling the uh, dosing of abscissimal. Abscissimal, the dose is 0.25 mg per kg start, followed by 0.125 microgram per kg per minute to maximum 10 microgram per kg. 10 microgram per kg should be given for up to 12 hours. Okay, so the dose is starting dose is 0.25 mg per kg. Start followed by 0.125 microgram per kg per minute up to maximum 10 microgram per kg given up to 12 hours. Side effect is of course bleeding. It's a common side effect of all antiplatelet agents bleeding, but along with that, thrombocytopenia is important. Thrombocytopenia is an important side effect. The risk of thrombocytopenia with abscissimab is with abscissimab the risk is around five percent. With other two drugs, other two drugs the risk is around one percent. Of course, you can understand because the platelet bound half life of abscissimab is, is abscissimab is more it has more propensity to cause thrombocytopenia. Now coming to the last group of drug that is the thrombopoietin. Uh, sorry, thrombin receptor antagonist. This is PAR1 antagonist. This is the mechanism of action. The dosing includes, the dosing is 2.08 mg OD. It is indicated for patients with patients with no history of no history of CVA and weight more than 60 kg. So it is used in patients with C, uh, sorry, CAD, coronary artery disease, but without any history of CVA and the weight has to be more than 60 kg. So I have told that uh, Prasuprel also should not be used in patients with CVA. So prasugrel is also avoided in patients with CVA because of high risk of intracranial bleed. Similarly, vorapaxar also avoided in patients with CVA because of high risk of bleeding. Side effect here, here also the side effect is, the most common side effect is bleeding. Side effect is bleeding. Any this is not very important. For the exams, the mechanism of action is important. Apart from that, it's not that important. So that's all uh, regarding the antiplatelet drugs. Please find the uh, uh, PPT link in the description. And in the next session, we'll be discussing about the uh, anticoagulants and then the fibrinolytic agents. Thank you, everyone.